Deutschland, just a guy trying to help out the monarch butterflies, and the season's obviously over. It's December. However, there's been some people who have asked me to make a video like this, and I wanted to check in with you here at the end of the season and show you how I do some quick just data analysis. Not going too in-depth here, but mostly, what was your success rate? And while it's an easy calculation, there are some details that maybe some people might want to know. If one person is reporting that they had an 85% success rate and another person just 70%, well, how are they actually calculating that? What butterflies are they counting? What butterflies are they not counting? Sometimes you're maybe not comparing apples to apples. So I thought I'd show you how I do mine. Just a couple things to mention though first. I don't think that there's a right or wrong way necessarily to do it. I just have chosen to do mine a certain way and what's important I think is that you make sure to do it consistently the same way. That way you can compare numbers from year to year. See how successful your season was. Another thing to note is that I've heard from others, haven't read it myself, but that sometimes on certain social media platforms, people are kind of treating it like it's a competition. And that's not really what I'm into whatsoever. I'm not reporting these numbers to say, look at what I did, ha. But instead it's just to keep data for myself so I can reflect from year to year how did things go. In some cases, some are treating it almost like well, you raised 100 monarchs, but I did 500, so ha! And something should be said just about how this is really about quality, not quantity. In some cases, there are monarch conservation groups out there that recommend you don't go past the number of 100, or some say not the number of 50. I don't know that there's a line to draw, and I think that there are logical arguments that as long as you're doing it responsibly, there isn't really an upper limit number. I do think it's up to the individual, but in all cases, we should be taking care to keep things sanitary and be responsible about the spread of disease. So in no way are any of these numbers that I'm reporting a way of trying to show off. I think that's pretty ridiculous. I already know there's people who have taken in and successfully released more healthy monarchs than I have this season, and I know there's people who have released fewer. It's not about that number. And when it comes to your success rate and what percentage made it, again, this is just so that way you can see how your system's doing and maybe try to make ways of improving it to try to notch that number closer to 100%. Okay, now for the fun part, the math. So when you go to calculate a percentage, it's always the same standard formula. You've got the part that you're actually interested in in a numerator position and the total amount in the denominator position. And then you multiply it by 100, so that way it turns it from a decimal fraction into a percentage. So the standard way of calculating a percent success rate would be taking the number of butterflies you've released, healthy, successful individuals, and divide it by the total number of monarchs that you tried to raise. Right? Pretty straightforward and simple. But actually, there are a couple details that maybe we should talk about. Like, for example, what if you take in some eggs and they don't ever hatch? Do you count those or not? What about caterpillars that you find in the wild? If you take them in and rear them, do you count those or not? These are the little nitpicky details, but they can influence what your success rate actually turns out to be. Further, when it comes to the monarchs that you say you have successfully raised, are you counting all of them, or are there times where maybe you don't count one? Well, again, it's up to you how you decide to choose these numbers. I'm just going to show you how I choose mine. In my journal, I keep track in the summer of whatever eggs I do end up finding, and also caterpillars that I take in. So in my entry, I'll talk about my thoughts and feelings and how the day is going. But also, I'll have a little box that says what the date was and whether it was eggs or caterpillars or both, how many I took in that day. Then I also put next to that how many total lives I have taken in, whether it's an egg or a caterpillar. In order to get the running tally, I just go back to the previous entry and see what the total lives were that I took in, and I just add to that number how many I'm taking in that day. And that's also why I box those, so I can quickly look back in the journal and find where the last update happened. And there's certainly other ways of doing this too. In fact, a few years ago I used to just have one sheet of paper where I'd write down the date of any eggs or caterpillars taken in and kind of do the same thing just all in one place. It's up to you how you do it. However, there are just a couple of situations where I won't actually count that monarch as a life that I've taken in. If I find a fourth or fifth instar caterpillar, I will still take it in, but that's where I've decided to draw the line. If it's fourth or fifth instar, I won't count it towards this number. I guess my rationale is just that since there's five instars of roughly the same time period, 
if it's already made it through three and it's now in the fourth or higher, then most of that time that it spent trying to you know, grow and survive was in nature and not with me. And if a caterpillar out in nature makes it to the chrysalis stage, well, it's past a lot of the trials and tribulations of nature, so it's probably going to make it. So really that caterpillar time period and the egg time period is when it's most vulnerable. And if it's already made it through all those hurdles, I don't think I should take credit for that monarch making it to a successful individual. I will still take it in and try to you know, caretake it for the rest of the time, but I don't count it towards my successful data. If I did count those, well then I guess I'd have a higher success rate, but again, it's not about trying to get the highest number I possibly can by working with the numbers. It's all about just making sure that I'm trying to get an accurate idea of how well is my process doing. So I definitely wouldn't want to inflate that data, and I guess I just feel that this is one way to minimize any inflation that could be there. If on a given year I found, let's just say, five fifth instar caterpillars, and they all made it, and I counted that towards my success rate, I might see a bump in my data as far as being more successful that year. And years later, looking back, I might not even remember that. I wouldn't want to seem like, hey, why did this year go so much better than the others? Just a way of keeping that influence out of it. The second situation, though, where I will not count the life is a situation where maybe I did count it, but I will actually subtract it from one of the lives I've taken in. And that's when an egg doesn't hatch. There's plenty of reasons why a monarch egg might not hatch. It could be that the egg was unfertilized to begin with. Butterflies have been known to lay unfertilized eggs, which are duds. Another reason is that there's certain types of parasites that will actually attack and infect the egg itself. And this causes the egg to die and never hatch out a caterpillar. And then, of course, you have a lot more random, I hope, but just possible genetic defects as to why it wasn't able to successfully produce a caterpillar out of the egg. In those cases, I am pretty confident it's not something that I did, but again, how do I know which cases were which? I don't. But what I do know is that I'm treating the eggs the exact same way as the other eggs I take in. I'm bleach treating them and I'm placing them in the same location, same temperature, same humidity, same everything. And if all these other eggs are successfully hatching and one doesn't, I don't think that there's any evidence to claim that it was somehow my fault. Hey, if I had some way of knowing that it was my fault, I'd be honest about it and I'd say that this was something that was wrong with my system. But in this case, I don't think that I have any reason to suspect that. So I will go back to my journal, I'll see how many lives I took in, and if there's any duds or any eggs that hadn't hatched, I'll subtract from that number. So according to the journal, last egg was taken in on August 26th, 2018, and it was just one egg, and that brought the grand total to 221 lives taken in this year. Okay, so we got the denominator of the equation. What's the numerator? How many successful monarch butterflies did I release? Well, how do you count that number? Pretty easy. If it's successful, then you release it and you count it as, hey, I released you. But a good question to ask is, are there any monarchs that do make it out of the chrysalis that we don't count? And for me, yes, there is. If I have any adults that cannot fly, I don't count them towards my success rate. Because, well, that's how I'm defining success. That it's a monarch butterfly that I'm able to release and it flies away. If a monarch butterfly has crumpled wings, and we talked a lot about that this season, there's a few videos on it, what do you do in those cases? For me, it's my own personal choice, but I don't want to count that as a successful released individual, even if I do still release it. If it can't fly, well, then could it have been some reason, some infection, something in my program that caused that to happen. So when it comes to monarchs that I don't count, it would be any of the ones that are unable to fly. And sometimes, too, I've had a butterfly that looks very healthy, and its wings look great, and still it's not able to fly. I certainly give it a few days to try to see what it can do, but in many cases they don't end up flying, and I'm never really sure why. I do still release those and wish them the best of luck that I can, but in such cases, I don't count that towards my success rate. I don't count it towards healthy, successful butterflies that I've released. Now for the touchy one, what about OE parasites? What if you have a monarch butterfly that looks healthy and can fly, but is also infested with OE? This topic's been covered in a few other videos, and I officially am taking the stance that that's up to you. That's a personal decision what you do. You can find experts that 
say that you should still release if it can fly, and you can find experts that say absolutely none of them that are infested with OE should be released. If you want to check out the video where this is discussed a lot further and more in depth, well, I'll have that in the description below. So any monarchs that do have any amount of OE parasites, I do not count towards my success rate. And I did have some that had OE infestation this year. Now I do bleach treat my eggs and leaves, but I think this was a case of monarchs that I had taken in and they were already caterpillars. That I only had a couple instances of this gives me also pretty good confidence that it wasn't my process that caused this. So my numerator is going to be successful monarch butterflies that I released that could fly and that had no signs of infestation of OE parasites. Now that could be as simple though as just, you know, jotting down a tally as you release them, marking how many you released. As many of you know though, I do test for OE, and so here I have a note card for each monarch butterfly that I've released. So I don't actually write this down in a notebook anymore, but instead, with the test result sample, I write down on there the date of release, not the date necessarily of it emerging from the chrysalis, but the date of release, whether it was a male or female, and I indicate on there that it was clean of OE parasites. So this way, uh, I do have a still convenient way of counting up how many did I successfully release. In the case of any that I didn't release, well, it was either OE infested, and that'll say so on the card, or in the case of crumpled wings, well, I still do test those for OE. I still wanna know if I have any OE infestation happening that I should be aware of. And so I will still have a note card for them too. And then separate from that, I start keeping separate cards for any that I have tagged. I'll still count them all in the data, but this way they're separated, so that way I can type up that information and send it to monarchwatch.org. And I don't know when you're watching this video, but I know I'm making it in December, and it's by the end of December that monarchwatch.org usually is asking for that data to please be submitted. So this is kind of just another helpful, gentle reminder, if you did tag your monarchs, please submit that data. You went through all that work, the scientists need it, please make sure to do it and don't forget. All right, so time to just start counting, right? Let's see how many successful monarchs I released this year. I'll spare you, though, watching me having to count through all of these. Okay, got the data. And so for males that were tagged, I had 22. For females that were tagged, 28. And for non-tagged successfully released adults, for males, I have 71. And for females, I have 61. Thus, a total of 93 males released and a total of 89 females released, bringing 182 to the grand total of how many successful monarchs I released. So now for the math, maybe you already beat me to it, but we've got 182 divided by 221 times 100, of course, but I'm dealing with 82.35, and I'll go to the tenths place, 82.4% success rate. Now again, in nature, it's a 10% or less, depending upon which studies you look at, chance of the monarchs making it from egg to adult. If you're beating 10%, you are already benefiting their chances of making it through your process much better than making it through nature. I don't have the data in front of me, um, but you know, most years when I've calculated it, just out of curiosity, I've been somewhere usually in the 80s, uh, this is low 80s this time around. It's usually in the higher 80s. So I don't know if there was something much different that happened with my process. I, I don't know of any off the top of my head, but it's good to see that I'm still consistently in there. If I got a number that was in like the 60s, well, then I might be informed. I should check out and see, go back to some notes or journal entries and see what was different that time around. But I haven't had a year like that. And I hope it's maybe needless to say, Looking at your percent success rate, well, that also needs to be factored in with how many did you successfully release because if somebody only does 10, a lot easier to maybe get a 90 or even 100% success rate if somebody is doing, you know, over 50, close to 100, past 100, it's definitely more challenging to try to get to that, you know, 90% or higher that maybe we're all hoping for. But either way, there's my data. And it'll be nice that I can just check back at this video and see what my data was. Maybe I'll do one of these every year. I don't know. So I hope your season went well. I hope it was successful. And I hope that this data helped you just see how I calculate my percent success rate. And it might have you just reconsider 
which monarchs are you counting, which ones are you not counting in such calculations. For those of you who are naturalists, I don't know if you've checked them out yet or not, but I've got something that might be up your alley, both the HerpQuest videos and also some new ones that are all about different types of minerals called Mineral Spotlight. Just giving a different little showcase information of some minerals that are out there. I'm Rich Lund, and I want to thank you very much for doing what you can to help out the monarch butterfly.